Hello, I'm Tommy Moore from the Bartitsa Lab, and in this video, I'm going to talk about aging. Now, my mum is sometimes in a wheelchair, sometimes using sticks, relatively immobile, and I find myself thinking about her and other people like her self-defence needs. And not only that, I start to think of my own needs. You know, every single person on the planet is starting to face a future where they may be living longer than they used to. But as they're living longer, they're getting more ailments, they're getting more problems, they're getting more issues. Uh, now, everyone has the right to defend themselves, to protect themselves, to use such force as is reasonable to be safe and to live a happy life. And so, if you start to think about age and you're a practicing martial artist, combatives person, combat sports person, it's important to understand and adapt to how you might want to start training now for what you need in the future. It's going to be very hard for you to start training in a different way when your knees start to go, when your back starts to go, when it starts to be very hard for you to exert any more than 15 seconds of energy. You know, all of these things can happen. So it's important to start training for those variables as soon as you can, so that if it happens or when it happens, and hopefully you live to be hale and hearty into your later days and then die in a wonderful way, going off to Rivendell, you know, whatever you're going to do. But most people will go old and bits will start to fall off them and it'll be very difficult indeed. So it's important to start to train for those realities as soon as you can. So for example, one such reality is you spend a lot more time as you get older, sat down. So being able to get up and defend yourself, to cover your head from a seated position, is a very important thing to start to train. Because if you're spending a lot more time in a wheelchair, in a bed, on your sofa, if there's a home invasion, you won't be able to get up as rapidly as you've done before. To be able to get up safely, quickly, without using too much explosive muscular force, that's an important thing to do. It's really key to start to understand what self-defence or self-protection considerations you might have or you might want to have or you might recommend to your family members as they age. So I'm going to go through a couple. Yeah. One of the first ones is making sure that you've got the right awareness skills, your soft skills. You know, as you start to age, you start to become a soft target or a visibly soft target. You know, it's a choice between me breaking into the scaffold next door in his 30s. You know, and I can see he's got boxing gloves dangling down from the mirror in his car. You know, I can see he's a tough dude. He's got a Rottweiler. Or I can go to Mr. Johnson, who has to walk with two sticks and he's pretty old and he's got a cat. You know, easy choice for a criminal, easy choice for a human predator. So you need that much more awareness. And that awareness is you know, looking switched on and being switched on. When I go into my door, when I leave my door, making sure I'm looking to the side of me, behind me, making sure that I've got the right technology in place. Do I have a decent alarm system? Do I have decent doors? Do I have decent windows? Do I have decent locks? Investing those things now before you need them. Make that, make yourself a hard target. Get used to verbal jujitsu. Get used to conversations you might have as people start to probe you, to test you, to challenge you. You know, think of all the fake door-to-door -door salesmen, the fake telesales people, all these different people and organisations that will try and hustle and trick you. You need to be get very good at the local endemics. What types of crimes are happening? How are people are being conned? What are they doing? And safeguard yourself against that. How you say it, how you come across. Come across as the guy that you don't want to burgle. Come across as the guy that is does have links to Neighbourhood Watcher, does have locks on his doors, and does call his son and daughter every night. Be visibly, audibly that guy. It's very, very important to have the awareness skills and to project that you are aware, project that you are looking, project that you are conscious about the world around you and in how you speak to people, especially people you don't know. It's really, really important to land those soft skills very well. It's important to invest in those technologies, as I said, windows, locks, doors, burglar alarms, personal rape alarms. You know, I'm a really big advocate of men carrying rape style alarms. You know, people say, oh, well, it's for women. It's a women's rape alarm. Like, well, no, it's an alarm. It's an alarm. And <laughs> you have as much right as anyone else to draw attention to a situation. So if you're an elderly person, carry two, carry three, carry as many as you like, as many as you need to draw attention. You can't rely on people coming to your aid. But it can't hurt to draw attention and awareness to your situation so that others may come to your aid. Especially if you're elderly, people are a lot more inclined to come support you if an alarm goes off, then you're the young couple next door. So invest in those alarm systems. 
Invest in looking and being and feeling aware and understanding the crime patterns around you. As you get older, you may wish, understandably, to have force multipliers. So, for example, whilst you might not carry things to defend yourself all the time as a younger person, you might consider things like a slightly more robust torch or pen or anything like that. Things that you can legally have on your person but act as a force multiplier and, and start to train with it and understand it. You know, if you walk the dog at night and your eyes are a little bit on the way out, buy a torch, buy a proper torch, a hard, metal, nasty torch, a torch that if you hit a cunt in the throat with it, he doesn't get back up. Get something which is comfortable enough for you to carry, light enough for you to carry, r robust enough to cause impactful injury if you've got no other choice. You know, so. As you start to get older, you might start to rely on force multipliers. I need to use less energy and I can get greater results by using a tool. So therefore, look at what tools you might have in, on, near, around your person, how to use them, how to access them, and understand that your ability to use them and access them is going to take a bit longer than most other people. So start to build in easy and efficient, smooth and therefore fast ways to deploy things that could assist you as well as being very useful for your daily life, being able to see better at night and all these other benefits, you may consider how do you deploy things that could be used for self-protection. Again, all within the bounds of reasonable force and the law, but it still makes a lot of sense for you to carry something that can support you in daily normal life and in extremis if you need it. A torch is a great example. When you start to look at unarmed skills, when you start to look at empty-handed skills, so let's imagine You've got the right awareness, you've invested in the right technology and security, you've potentially trained and have access to things that could be improvised force multipliers and you know how to use that and using that matches what's in your ability to do because I'm aware that as you age differently, bits of you fall off differently. For some people it's the knees, the wrists, the hands, the shoulders, the back, the feet. You know, so you need to optimise. You know, it's a bit like boxing. Protect yourself at all times, defend yourself at all times. You are always responsible for you. So, you know, as you start to age, in that process, you need to be a lot more cognizant of what suits your particular needs and requirements. But the use of tools and having them accessible, and you being aware of them and knowing how to use them and having trained that somewhat is key. When you start to look at empty-handed skills, sometimes you've got nothing. Sometimes you don't have that torch or that pen, or you've just got out of bed and then suddenly there's this bad dude here. And again, I'm trying to do things from a from a, a lower posture, from things that don't require much muscular or skeletal force. Hopefully, again, invest in diet and fitness and exercise and healthcare so you end up as physically able as possible, but age will come to everyone who stays alive long enough. So again, when you look at things from an older person's perspective, you know, you've probably got five to 15 seconds in the tank of concerted activity. You know, when I work with, with my family members, that's the kind of baseline we're looking at. Five to 15 seconds of, I can put reasonable physical force into a space. And this is why I like things like uh, Tim Larkin's target focus training, in that you don't have the time or the capacity or the ability to focus on anything that's only gonna have half an effect. You know, a younger person, they might go, palm strike, palm strike, shot to the body, whatever. You know, they can build in flows, combinations. You know, everyone still wants to end a fight quickly, but you've got more laxity in, in what you do and choice. For an older person, you know, you start to really boil your syllabus and your targeting down. So you might be thinking, what can I break or cause damage to using just really the power of my arms or my hands or my knee? In which case that might be into the eye, into the throat, into the groin. These are kind of basic areas. Eyes, throat, groin. And what techniques can I do? Older people tend to struggle with lateral movement. Lateral movement is a young man's game, young person's game. Being able to move, shuffle, hit, switch your legs, do all this stuff. You could be a very fit, you know, 80 year old triathlete, that's fine. But for most people, that's gonna be pretty difficult. What I've found is that most people can still, if they've got operable legs, move forwards and move backwards. So you might want to optimise for things like that. And what is helpful for older people is things like being able to drop step, being able to put your weight 
forward and into a blow. So we're going to take a very simple example. We'll take a clawed eye gouge. It might be we go from a point of deception. You know, you might just be getting your keys out and you do a falling step eye gouge here, giving you enough time to just close that front door, lock it, pull on the alarm, whatever you need to do. That ability to take a falling step here is something that is relatively easy to do. It's something my mum could do. She's had several strokes, heart attacks. Being able to fall forward, get the eyes, is something that will buy you enough time to close a door, to pull an alarm, to find another solution. So in and arm skills, falling steps forward are really great for eyes with a clawing motion. You don't want to have to aim. Aiming is a finite skill. So you're just going to treat the face like a bowling ball. It's going to go all in. In the throat, edge of hand blows work quite well, even for older people, falling into them. So being able to use your forearm, the edge of the hand, just dropping into that shot is a relatively easy shot to do. You know, even here, just being able to do this motion, being able to combine that. So edge of hand to the throat, claws to the eyes. These are things that are still attainable if any of you've got is slightly clumsy or awkward forward backward motion. If you're going backwards, being able to fade off. So being able to step backwards and just push off against the eyes. Just push off against the eyes. Boom. Now of course, if you're a young fit person, you can have those skills and you can have big bombastic boom, boom, bang. You got all this crazy shit going on. Double leg takedown, fucking guillotine choke, flying arm bar, whatever the fuck you want to do. That's cool. As you start to get older, obviously your ability to retain those skills, those techniques, the ability to apply them ballistically is much, much more difficult. But for a lot of people, being able to fade and just bat straight into the eyes might be what I need to pull out my torch, or it might be what I need to pull out my alarm, or it might be enough to just cause enough damage for him that he decides to fuck off and go for a weaker target. So falling in with the claw, falling in, with the forearm to the throat, fading off to the fingers of the eyes, falling in to the knee to the groin, you know, these kind of falling drop step lights in, or being able to fade out backwards, those are useful and ubiquitous tools to deploy. So again, think about your target focus training. What are you going for? How are you going for it? What are you able to do now? What will you likely be able to do 20 years from now? And make sure you also factor in that 20 years from now you, so you can get used to those techniques and build them in. You know, get used to defending yourself now and start to train and plan for the future too. That's important. We get so in the present, we forget preparedness for the future. If you spend 30 years doing suplexes, scarf holds and strangles, that's cool. Are you pulling it off when you're 80? Maybe not. So again, you know, have fun while you can, but also have an eye for the future. I think that's very important anyway. So we start to look at potentially we've got soft skills, awareness, looking aware. We've got technology, alarms, bolts, doors, dogs, whatever. You've got extra tools such as pens, flashlights, force multipliers. You've got a limited repertoire of high percentage target orientated techniques. And then finally to wrap up, I'm just going to look at mobility tools. Now a lot of people, as they get older, they spend a lot of time in chairs. When they're out of chairs, they'll either have one or two sticks. And they'll either be on a hook cane or a derby cane system. And there are pros and cons to using both. The important thing is to invest in a high value cane. So don't just get a cheap one, whether it's for you, your parent, whatever. Buy one made of decent wood with decent heft. You know, it still needs to be light enough to be comfortable, to meet your ability needs. But by the same token, it needs to be robust enough to take a beating and you should train with the stick that you use. Train with the stick that you use. If you train with a particularly light stick, but your real stick is heavy or vice versa, you're gonna have a bad time. So buy and invest one properly and where you can train with that particular stick. It'd be like a samurai training with a slightly different sword than he carries every day. It'd be a stupid idea. So again, stick usage. I like the Derby cane which is this type of handle, because it's got relatively weaponized and nasty edges. You know, it's not that it's designed to be a weapon, but it just incidentally is that way. You know, so they typically have these 
hardened spurs here and here, which almost gives it a hammer-like effect at either end. It's almost a bit of a war hammer in some ways. You know, most of the hitting you'll be doing is with the bottom end, but it's good to know that you've got a reasonable business end up front. I don't really buy into many techniques that use them to bar or to leverage or to twist. They're okay for young people. You can pull off stick grappling, that's cool. As you get older, grappling with that stick is just a lot less feasible. Your ability to move an 18, years, 18 stone human by hooking their neck is going to be pretty difficult when he's trying to fight you. So really, you've got the stealth fighter's option. It's how do I hit you really fucking hard with the stick in a place that really hurts to buy me enough time to affect my own escape or safety? That's really what we're looking at. How do I use 5 to 15 seconds of nasty to get the job done? And often that won't really involve protracted grappling with the stick. It can happen, but you want to avoid it at all possible. So, great thing about Derby Kane is you've got this little trigger here. So even with the power of your thumb, you can bring the stick up, and that's important. If, if you can stand somewhat without the stick, and it's important, you, if you can't stand without the stick, you're, you're pretty fucked in using the stick, let's be honest. But for most people that are using it, they can stand for some degree of time without it, they can hobble a little bit without it, it's just this makes it easier for them, as it is with my family. But you've got this little trigger here, which makes it quite easy to bring the stick up. So your first point of call, any sign of danger, bring the stick up, and retain the stick with both hands and withdraw it. If I hold it into no man's land, he's gonna grab it straight away, pull it off me and probably pull me down with it. So I need the ability to have the stick drawn in close to my body and be pointed at your throat or at your eyes. So importantly, go from position one to here and I'm gonna do this hunched over, here. It's important, most people are hunched over anyway when they're old. But keep your chin down, keep your eyes up but your chin's down. That's another important training drill. Don't get knocked out, don't make it easy for you to be banged on the chin. Yep. Same discipline if you were a young boxer, you tuck your chin, same shit here. Boom, tuck your chin, make it hard for your chin to be hit. Have this pointed up, okay? Have this withdrawn somewhat so you can then strike out with it. So once it's drawn, that same falling step we talked about, Provide that with the short, sharp thrusts to the throat, to the eyes, to the solar plexus, to the groin, and get very good at targeting areas that will have maximum effect. You know, is the juice worth the squeeze? If it spends a lot of my energy doing this, I want to make sure it goes right in your solar plexus, right in your trachea, right in your eyeball, or right in your bollocks. Yeah, you know, because higher levels of force will likely be justified as you're an older person at sufficient disadvantage. So if you can, drop your chin, be ready, then falling step forward to drive this in. You can just use the arms, but that's a low level of force. If you can even take the smallest drop step forward, that will aid you immensely. Just before the foot hits the ground, the stick hits the target. Nice and simple. Nice, nice and simple. At all times where possible, keep two hands on the cane. Because if he grabs it, two hands is better than one. If I've got one hand and he's got one hand, this will be stripped off you easy. So try and keep solid retention as if it were a rifle. If he does grab it, follow the same advice you would if you were trying to retain a rifle. You falling step in, so you push, you pull and twist. So you push, let's say he's grabbed the end of this, I push, I pull and twist out, like so. You know, it's not guaranteed to leave his hands, but it's one of the best methods, one of the highest percentage methods. What you also might find is you might need to abandon that weapon. So let's imagine I've pulled in, I've done this, and I've not quite landed this properly, and he's grabbed the end of the stick. I could push, pull, and twist, but if that doesn't work and he's still holding onto it, don't fight over the stick, this is where you might need to transition to that falling step and claw to the eyes. That's where you might need to transition to another physical tool. And that's absolutely important to understand. Here the weapon's useful, here's the weapon's useful. If he's grabbed it, there's no chance of me easily retaining it. If he's holding onto that stick, he's not punching me in the face. Take his eyes, then push, pull, twist. Nice and simple, nice and simple. 
As an older person, you may be denying or barring entry. So you might have inadvertently or unwisely answered the door. I'm just going to turn my screensaver off. You might have inadvertently or unwisely answered the door. I'm standing in the door, I want to bar your entry. So in this instance, I've withdrawn. I might then take it to the flat of my body. And again, being able to push against the throat, the shoulder line, or if I'm much smaller, the hip line. So get used to the same drawing system, the same cocking mechanism here. Have it pointed towards the face. As he starts to try and enter the doorway, depending on your height and your size, push off against the hips, the shoulders, or into the throat. The throat has the best visceral reaction. The shoulders take a bit of strength. The hips are surprisingly effective. I might only need to move you six inches to close that door, you know, to pull the alarm, to do something else. Bear in mind, you know, every space gives me choice. Choice to pull something, choice to call someone, choice to shout, choice to lodge a door, to close a door. Space equals choice. Again, here, I've got this up. He's starting to force entry. You can stop him at the hips, stop him at the shoulders, stop him at the throat. Once he's gone out, either make sure that you're moving to push them out, or if you can't move out, be percussive as you can. So it might be you bar, and you fire. So you might be pushing pressure and striking pressure. Pushing pressure, striking pressure. There are different usages for different purposes. So again, that is an important one. So step one, being able to get yourself relatively on guard. To know with a falling step, what to target and how to compound it. Throat, solar plexus, groin, groin, solar plexus, eyeball, whatever. You know, get used to moving up and down that map. Get used to do the same technique, to bar or to strike as you bar. Okay, these are important things. The only strike I really consider with the stick outside of a thrust, thrusts are much more likely to work for you. The only strike I do consider is if you're a little bit more able and you've got the hip motion to it, if it's going to kick off from here, you may decide to laterally move the stick this way. From here, turn your hips and strike. In reality, this is just to allow you an opportunity to get to something like this. I don't really like it, but if the space allows, well, let's say I'm being talked to here, and this guy starts to worry me, but it's important to make sure it comes up at a sharp angle. It catches him by surprise, and you want to make sure you hit him somewhere bony, on the jaw or in the temple. You've got a hard stick here. So don't waste that time on something soft or something less than damaging. If you're going to talk it, yeah, but that does require an extra element of force and energy. I don't have to step. I can move my hips and shoulders. A step with it is beneficial. So if I do step, or if I can step diagonally, I can do this. But again, I'd much rather advise retention, using it to jab and thrust to dangerous targets. But you do have that option if you want to strike. I wouldn't advise backhand strikes with these as you get older, because their ability to take you off balance is really, really high. But forehanded strikes, if it's preemptive, so if you pretend you can't hear, you smash that in, then it's important to get to this ready retention position to do the things we talked about, the jabbing thrusts. But most importantly, Take the time to explore the options, work with older people, work with older students, see what is possible, see what is not possible, experiment with it, test it as practically and as robustly as you can while still being safe. As you get older you can still pressure test just in a slightly different way. So it's important you don't just treat it like self-defense Tai Chi, you still have to go for it, you still have to hit stuff, hit people, hit targets. You can be a responsible training partner for older people, still give them the level of force and resistance they need so that if they need to rely on stuff, it is useful to them. But I would say, 
Soft skills. Technology, locks, windows, doors, dogs. Improvise weapons, have access to things that could work in your favor. Unarmed skills, have a small, well-drilled repertoire of things that are target orientated that require little strength. And if you do have mobility aids, invest in something useful, something robust, and drill it earlier rather than later so you get familiar and your body gets familiar with that tooling system. It's more of a thinking philosophical video. You know, I'm still finding my way through thinking about these things, um, but it's, good. it's always good to think about the future. So take the time, think about your self-defense needs, be fit, be healthy, do all the contact sports you like, do all the hard combatives you like, but also have a mind towards the future about who you might be and what you might need and how to best get there and how to best support people that see you as an instructor. Good luck, happy training.